So today I have the Blaupunkt Reno SQR46 car radio. This came from the sort of mid to late 80s. Um, it's commonly fitted to Porsche 911s from 87 through to 89. And I believe it may also have been fitted to 944s and 928s as well, uh, but I'm not entirely sure. A very interesting unit, a lot of features for its day. So I'm going to spend some time now going through both the physical overview as well as we'll delve into all the features and functionality. So of course, all the controls are across the front. I'm not going to go into this much detail now. I've got a lot more detail coming up on that. On the top, we actually get a sticker which shows all the connectivity. I've got a larger version of that sticker right here, so we can go and take a look at that. Basically, this is a four-channel unit. So if we go through some of these pinouts, you'll see there's a proprietary connector at the back. In fact, the harness of the car looked something like this. And these are still available online today that you can go and buy a replacement connector if you don't have one. So there's two slightly wider pins on the left and a couple of narrow pins on the right. But this radio is only using a few of those pins. You can see over here we have ground as the very first pin. The next one down is 12 volt coming from ignition. So this is the main power to operate the unit. Um, this one over here is a 12 volt pass through. So this can be, this sends a 12 volt signal out when the radio is on. So if you have something like a power antenna, you can power it off this pin and when the radio is on, it will send that 12 volt signal. And then lastly, this is a permanent 12 volt coming straight from the battery. Um, that is specifically to keep the radio memories stored for this particular unit. Now you would have seen this configuration before. It's very similar to the Blaupunkt Monterey which is that SQR23, an older model, which I went through recently on my channel. Um, one difference though is notice that this pin is one step over. On the Monterey, that pin sits over here. And on this unit, that pin is actually moved over one step to the left, which is an interesting difference. As I mentioned before, this is a four channel unit. They use these two pin DIN connectors. Now this is what those connectors look like over here. You can see it's got basically one round pin and one flat blade. And those plug directly to the back of the unit for these four. Now the, car, the cars of that era came with these connectors in the harness. These are just some replacements that you can also get online. So we have right front and left front, and then we have left rear and right rear on this side. And lastly, there's a connector over here for the preamp to send this out to a power amplifier. So let's look at the unit itself and you can see what those connections look like. There we go. So there are those four uh, outputs for the four speakers. Here's that power connector. And lastly, uh, this preamp out. So the last thing I'd like to do now is actually run through some of the features and functionality. Now I'm actually going to do this here uh, right on my workbench. So what I have is I have a benchtop uh, power supply, which I'm going to use. It's just off camera over here. Let me see if I can show you what that looks like. There it is. And I have a couple of speakers, which I'm just going to plug into this unit. You can see over here, I already have some of those two pin DIN connectors. And lastly, I have a little cheaper freestanding FM antenna. So let me wire up this unit and then turn it on. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'll turn this around. The back is start with the earth connector or the ground connector, which is right here at the last one on the end. So I'm going to go and plug that in. There we go. Um, the next one over is going to be for the power. This is actually the one that's going to operate the unit. This is a slightly wider spade plug. And I've got a slightly narrower one, which is just needed for this one over here. I'm not going to use that pass through. So that's those three, pretty easy. And I'm going to do the antenna as well. You can see here's the antenna out jack on the left of the unit. It's very standard design. And lastly, the two speakers. I'm actually going to turn this unit around and plug in some speakers. There's the one. And here's the other. Now this is a four channel unit. I only have the two speakers here uh, on my workbench right now, but that's fine. I can demo this entire unit with just two speaker operation in a typical uh, car installation it would be four. I'll plug this here to the benchtop power supply. And let me tilt this up so that you can see a little better on the camera. There is the unit. I'm gonna turn on my power supply and I've set my power supply over here to be 13 volts. Let me see if I can show you. There we go, 13.6. This is basically to simulate a car that's currently driving. Uh, if a car was offered, it would be 12 volts, but with the car running and the alternator, it pushes out slightly more stronger signal. So let's go down to the unit some more. There we go. I'm going to move this back ever so slightly. So you can easily see the radio. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it on. So that's done by turning the volume knob. The volume knob has a little switch, which also then 
There we go, turns on the unit. And that is a quick overview of the outside. From now on, let's delve into the features and functionality. Right, let's start with some general audio features. I'm going to turn up the volume. You can hear a hissing noise, and I'm just going to seek for any channels. I'll hit the seek button just so we can get some audio. Beating up on everybody oh, else. There we go. And so there we can hear tuned into a channel, um, which is shown on the display right now. So the first feature I'd like to show you over here is, of course, uh, adjusting the volume, which we've done, turning this knob, and then to the left, there's a little lever, which is our loudness switch. The so you can see, let's really boost the bass a bit. With the message that people were manipulating. See, now Roger the loudness switch is off. You can hear the bass is slightly reduced. And he was an early investor in Facebook. Thanks so much for being And there the loudness switch is back My on again, so thereby really boosting fun. the bass. So that's loudness over here, and the next two we can adjust is tone, bass and treble, which are sitting over here. Now these are interesting switches, you can kind of click them in and they just pop out a little, and then you can turn them to adjust them. So we can turn up the bass, and there's a little um, click at the zero position, and then all the way down to the minus, and then similarly for the treble as well. There's the treble all the way up, and back again, and then we can go and click them back in again. And lastly, we can move the sound around a little bit, so we have balance and fader. The balance is real easy, similar switch, click on the balance switch, you turn this all the way to the left, so audio is just coming out over here. Once again, click in the middle, or all the way to the right, and anywhere in between that you want. Now the fader is a little bit different, the fader is actually also in the same volume knob, and it actually does a couple of features. So in order to use the fader, you actually have to pull this ring slightly out, and then you can adjust the fader, left and right. So here's a gate all the way to what's effectively the front. If I go the other way, it's all the way to the rear and you'll hear all the sound disappears entirely because I've got no rear speakers plugged in. And let's go back to the middle and there's a little click once again right in that middle position. The next general feature I'd like to show you is setting the clock. So that's done by clicking this button. When you click this button, it displays the clock. See, it's been two minutes since we've powered this unit in. And by holding in the memory button and using seek, you can adjust the minutes and the seconds. Now you notice the clock disappeared after eight seconds. So to set the clock, you first need to press the clock button to show, hold in memory, and then hit the seek button. And see over there, I'm adjusting minutes. There I'm adjusting hours. Let's say it's 5.30 as an example. I can go all the way to 5.30. When I'm done, release the memory button, and the clock is now set. Now what will happen is that even though this clock is set, it will only once again show for a couple of seconds, and then it's reverted back to the FM display. So what you can do is you can show the clock permanently. It's a little bit of a weird key combination. You basically click the clock first to display the clock, then you hold memory and tap clock one more time to say that's what I like to show all the time. So let's do that now. So clock to show, hold memory, tap clock, you can see it's not blinking anymore, release. And now it will permanently show the clock display on the uh, display itself. Um, if you want to, of course, change that back again to showing the frequency of the currently tuned in station, it's the same procedure to do this in reverse. So once again, hold clock, it shows frequency, hold memory, tap clock, and now you can see it's basically toggled that over to now show frequency instead of time by default. And right, so those are some general audio features. Uh, coming in now, we'll delve in further into the radio functions and into the cassette functions. So yeah, these are just some general features. Right, let's look at some of the radio uh, features and functionality on this unit. The first thing we're going to do is just uh, seek for some channels. You can see here by just pressing the seek buttons to the left or the right, we'll either start seeking in the current frequency. We've currently defaulted to FM. So press it once. And you just can see they before. have immediately found a channel at 88.5. Pressing it again, we'll seek for the next channel. I don't think this antenna works all that great, but it'll eventually find one. There we go, it's found a channel. And you can store that into any one of these six preset buttons. Now this is a little awkward on this unit. Typically on most modern radios today, you would just press and hold the number that you want and it would go and save that. This one works slightly differently because of course it does. So you have once again used that memory function just like with the clock earlier. So we press memory, press the number that we want and you can see it's now stored in FM1 for this channel over here. We we'll go and find another one. There we go. You can press once again memory, number two, and it's stored it into FM2. So now we can toggle between those two very easily there's one, there's two. You'll also notice that this stereo indicator appears over here when it is a stereo channel that has been tuned in. 
Now, if you don't want to seek for your uh, stations automatically, you can do so manually as well. And that's by using this M button. When you click that, the little LED lights up to say it's now in manual mode. And you'll notice that each click of the seek button is just moving 0.2 in frequency. So I can basically fine tune this to any channel that I want. Let's go and find something. There we go. There's a channel. Once I'm happy, once again, memory. And three, there I've gone and saved it. Let's go find something else. There we go. Memory in four. And I've saved that as well. And I can turn off manual tuning. We basically have four presets that are now saved in. Right, so now that we have those four presets, what else can we do? Well, there's aren't the only ways. There's also a scan function to get a sort of preview of all the various stations. I have yet another feature for this volume button over here. In this case, if you just click this button in, here's a single click. You see it'll tune in automatically and seek the next station. Play that station for eight seconds, and thereupon it will continue on and seek the next station again. So there it's gone on again. It's 98.1. Gives us a few seconds. After eight seconds, it's going to roll forward to that next station again. And there it goes. And to stop this mode, you just once again click on this button, and there we're out of seek mode, and we'll remain in the particular channel that we're in, or you can manually seek to something else as well. Right, so those are all the sort of general radio functions, and we did everything in FM right now. The last one left, of course, is the toggle to go into AM mode, and then I can go and tune in my various AM stations and save them into the buttons in exactly the same way. Now, heading back to uh, FM, there's one more feature that I want to show you, and that's this ARI button over here. Now, what's interesting is if you look in the documentation, you'll see that it defines ARI as automatic radio information, which is basically some traffic broadcast that gets sent uh, to this unit so that if there is a traffic warning in your area, it'll tune into that channel and give you a warning. Almost exactly the same as the TA functionality in the RDS features of radios of today. Now, this predates that a little bit, and I thought, well, this is kind of interesting. When I Google ARI, I found almost nothing. I mean, very, very little. The first thing I did find here in this August 1983 a copy of Popular Science, I found one small little article at the back, which is basically beat the traffic with ARI on the radio. And when I looked at this map, you can see over here, this is basically just the northeast or the greater New York area for the various zones. Features a very old Blaupunkt radio. And it does call attention to the fact that this has been available in Europe for many years. But this ARI has been developed by primarily Blaupunkt uh, in order to be able to get this radio information uh, for traffic. Fun little more, there was a New York Times article on this as well, February 5th, 1984, talking about ARI being the motorist's friend. And you can see here, started by a German firm Blaupunkt a decade ago, there we go, in Europe, and it's now coming across to uh, North America. Now, I'd never heard of this and I found very little and I thought, well, that's kind of strange because why is this so little information on ARI? Well, eventually I stumbled on the fact in Wikipedia that the actual German name for this is Autofahrer Rundfunk Informationssystem, which also literally stands for the three letters ARI. And that was basically renamed to match the acronym as Automatic Radio Information. Now, it's not technically quite correct. Uh, even the Wikipedia translation isn't 100% correct. Literally, the translation for Autofahrer Rundfunk Informationssystem would be Motorists Broadcast Information System. But I guess MBI isn't the same as ARI, so that's why they didn't do that. Um, furthermore, interestingly, this article over here on Wikipedia talks about attempts to deploy this into the US and how it wasn't all that successful because even though Blaupunkt was the only one that had weight behind this. Also, what's interesting over here is that this is the demise. Let me see if I can find the date. It was here on the, in this article. Oh, here it is again okay, on the front page. And as I mentioned before, ARI was obsolete because it was replaced by RDS, which almost all radios have now and it was killed entirely on March 1st, 2005. Now, I know that's the date it was killed in Europe. I have no idea what the corresponding date was in North America. I assumed it never got even close to as far as that. So, getting back to the unit, that makes this kind of a useless feature, but let's assume that ARI did indeed exist. We can turn it on by pressing this ARI button, and notice how ARI lights up here on the display, and it's trying to find an ARI broadcast on any of these channels. Of course, no longer being broadcast, it's not gonna find anything. Similarly, we can pick our zone and say which ARI zone are we in. And this corresponds back to this article from Popular Science, where you can see over here in the greater New York region, 
this was already broken up into various zones and you would pick your zone based on where you really are. And the intent was to divide the whole country that up that way and have your local zones and you can go and just go and pick that ARI zone. Now of course this is going to carry on searching forever so I can just hit ARI again, turn off that feature because that doesn't work. Right, so those are some of the basic radio functions uh, for this unit. Right, let's look at some of the cassette features on this uh, unit. So I'm going to insert the cassette, let's say uh, anyway around, and it'll immediately start playing over here. Now, in order to not get caught by the YouTube police, I'm going to have to run through some of these functions and talk over this pretty quickly. The first feature over here you can see, of course, is this uh, DNR button, which I guess more commonly you would assume to mean do not resuscitate. That's not actually what this one means, interestingly enough. According to this, the DNR button is dynamic noise reduction, which I've never heard of before. But in the bottom, you can see quite interestingly here, it's a registered trademark of National Semiconductor. So after some quick Googling, I realized that that pretty much means it probably has this LM1894 chip that's installed in the unit itself. And what's interesting about this, I've never actually even heard of this before, it's a stereo noise reduction circuit for use in audio playback systems, but it's non-complementary. So that means it does not require any encoding of the source material, unlike Dolby, uh, but rather it just tries to apply some sort of noise reduction directly to the current tape it's getting right now. So of course you can hit that DNR button and it clicks in, it's toggled in to enable that, or click it again to toggle out to disable that. The next one is pretty simple, Dolby noise reduction. Now this has two modes, both Dolby B and C. Clicking it once, the Dolby symbol lights up on the display over here. Clicking it a second time, it flips over to Dolby C noise reduction. And the third time, we'll turn that off entirely. The next one across is our tape selector type. Now it's MTL, basically metal. And as for the documentation, that's used for both. And it clicks in, nothing on the display. This is for both chrome and metal tapes, is what this mode is for over here. Right, so those are some of the tape select or tape type settings. Let's go through to the transport controls, which are in this area here. So first to fast forward, basically just click this FF on the right. Tape will start fast forwarding. Until you're happy, you can just click the program button and then it immediately starts playing. Similarly, rewind. Hit the left button, that will just rewind as much as you want. And you can hit the play button to start playing. Now, there is an additional feature in here, which is called CPS, which is this cassette program search function, which is basically used along with this memory button that it's supposed to search for uh, gaps in the tape. You can see here if there's a gap of at least three seconds or more, it'll go and find it. Now, I I've been struggling to get this to work because they say that actually it's enabled by default. So if I just press rewind, it should basically find, oh, there we go. Lo and behold, there it works. It's found the gap between the two songs and started playing. Let's do that again. Oh, I should be skipping that song. Let's see if it stops at a previous song when it gets to the beginning of that song. Hmm, seems to be rewinding for a very long time. Maybe my gaps on my tape. Oh, there we go. Oh, and it starts playing a new song. I'm turning it super quiet because of course I don't have the copyright for any of these songs. So that's the CPS function. So this is basically skip next track and previous track. And if you want to defeat that, you basically turn on the memory function and then fast forward and rewind. We'll just keep on going all the way. There we go, it's actually at the beginning of the tape and it's, it'll just start playing. So that's to turn off the CPS function, which is on uh, by default. So let me turn, uh, let's fast forward because I think I've actually reached uh, the very beginning of my tape which is no good, so let's fast forward a little bit. And let's play. And there we have some music. And the last function is this program function used. Notice I've used this the whole time to cancel fast forwarding and rewinding, but of course it's also used to flip the tape. So you can see which direction the tape is playing right now, which I believe is to be the underside of the tape. And when I click this button, it clicks to the right, which I believe is the, the top side of the tape. Um, this is at the, towards the end of that, so there's not really any music there right now. And then the last function, of course, is to eject. So you just hit this eject button. It's a soft eject, so you can see it gently will eject the tape. And similarly, if you just turn the unit off, it will also then soft eject the tape at that point as well. All right, and that's an overview of the features and functions of the SQR46 Reno.